Tonight, we are going to witness the most anticipated match in the history of professional wrestling for the heavyweight championship of the world. Are you ready? Wrestling fans, are you ready? For the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world, from the capital city of the United States of America, Washington, D.C., ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Yeah! <laughs> Been in any fights lately? Have you ever been in a fight? Been in a fight recently, maybe? Not a fist fight. I'm talking about a spiritual one. Mm-hmm. Let me just survey the room to see who I'm talking to. Is there anybody in here that knows what it's like to be in a spiritual fight? Okay, just want to check. Last Sunday, I was at a church. Um, if you came here, I was at another church. I had a suit on and everything. And... Um, <laughs> It was one of those churches where when you preach, they talk back to you the whole time you're preaching. Like, if you say something, they say, well. <laughs> say something, they say, come on. You're standing up. and they, One service, a 12 o'clock service, they were throwing money on me and stuff while I was preaching. Yeah, preach, preach. So we don't usually do that, but since it was just last week and I'm still feeling that, used to that, I'm going to need you all to step it up today. <laughs> all my churchy people didn't know how to talk back to the preacher. Y'all have my permission today. Just tell somebody right now, I'm going to be a little loud and all that. Just get with it. This is a special occasion. That's what's up. Spiritual fight. I personally feel like I'm in a war, spiritually. In fact, I feel like I've been getting jumped. Where I'm from, if you got jumped, that means you fight more than one person. Which means you're probably losing. <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to get any pity from you all because I feel like I'm getting jumped. Because one thing I know, that God gave me this message because he knew there was going to be some other people here that know what it's like to be in the fight of their life. So I want to help somebody who's fighting today. You might be fighting for your family, fighting for your life, fighting for your health, fighting for your sanity fighting for your wellness, fighting to not quit. Somebody is about to quit everything and walk away from it all and say, see you later. I ain't doing this no more. I don't have enough in me to do it again. I cannot do this another day. I am tired and exhausted from this fight. So I understand that I'm not alone when it comes to being in a fight. And I also don't need any, really, really need any pity today because I understand that one of the enemies surrounding me, one of those enemies is me. You know, as a Christian, we have three enemies, the Bible says. The Bible says we have three enemies, Satan, the world, and our flesh. Those are our three enemies. Satan, who has a lot of help. He has millions of demons who assist him in his diabolical agenda. And then we have the world, a system and people and things that are totally opposed to the agenda of God. And then we have our own flesh, our human nature, our body, which is at enmity with God. We have this to contend with. And when all three of those forces come against you, it's like being surrounded, being surrounded. And at the end of the day, it's difficult because it tires you out. It exhausts you when you're fighting. Fighting is exhausting. Arguing is exhausting. Do you not know that psychological exhaustion is more exhausting and tiring than physical exhaustion? That if you are psychologically exhausted, having a fight with your spouse and fighting with your children and trying to get them to do the right thing, and fighting with your boss and fighting with people in your life, you can lay down in the bed for hours and never go to sleep. You can close your eyes and never get any rest. You can lay down for 12 hours and be as tired as you were when you went to sleep. You went to sleep with a fight on your mind, woke up with a fight. Am I preaching to anybody yet? 
that knows what it's like to be tired. And I'm tired because I'm fighting myself, Mo. I don't have to fight. See, I don't need Satan to help me sin. I'm dirty enough on my own. I'm messed up enough on my own. I got my own mess I have to deal with. My own foibles, my own flaws, my own lust, my own desire, my own evil thinking. I don't know about, I know you wish you had a pastor that was real righteous and real spiritual like that and had it all together. But let me just know, if you ever met a pastor that had it all together, it's only because he hadn't showed you what's really wrong with him because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I just happen to be one of them pastors that put it all out there for you. You don't have to wonder about me, I'll tell you. You ain't got to follow me around, track me around, follow me through the neighborhood, watch me in the mall. Yes, I'm messed up. Yes, I got issues. Yes, I'm working on it. Yes, I'm trying to be like Jesus. But I don't always do right, I don't always say right, and I sure don't always think right. Sometimes I think the wrong stuff. I'm sorry, my thoughts are not always on the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me. My soul doesn't always cry, hallelujah, and thank you, God, for saving me. I'm not always thinking on the mountaintop about the goodness of God and how God matriculated through the earth and spoke the world into existence and how he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not always thinking about the goodness of God. Sometimes my thoughts get reduced down to me and what I want, and I'm unhappy, and what makes me happy. I think evil thoughts and dirty thoughts and sinful thoughts. The things I think about doing, I don't, I'm don't. i embarrassed about it. And as a matter of fact, I know I'm not alone here because if we could run your thoughts across this screen in here today, you would walk up out of here just like this before we even got the two-minute warning going in your thoughts. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not only do I not think the right thing, but I get tired of not saying the right thing. Sometimes I'm not like y'all. I say stuff I shouldn't say, Albert. I say things out of my mouth that should never come out of my mouth. And then sometimes I don't say things that I should say. That's a dichotomy right there. I'm saying stuff I shouldn't say. I need to say this, but my flesh shuts me down and won't let me say the right things. And then I'm not only fighting my words and I'm fighting my thoughts, I'm fighting my deeds. Sometimes I go beyond thinking and saying, I do stuff I should never do. The, the, evil, the Bible says when I do good, evil is always present with me, trying to live right, trying to be a Christian, even when I preach, even when I tithe, even when I do go to small group and do the right thing, sometimes evil is present right there with me. I'm struggling with doing the right thing. Instead of doing the right thing, like getting in the word and, and praying and studying the Bible and giving and being loving and generous, I don't have time to do the right thing because I'm so busy doing the wrong thing and doing things I ain't got no business doing. Does anybody else in here know what that's like to live with that kind of struggle and when you live like that as a Christian it makes you depressed it makes you tired it makes you embarrassed it makes you ashamed it makes you feel like giving up it makes you feel like throwing in the towel like I'm not even good enough to be a pastor I'm not even good enough to be a husband I'm not even good enough to be a father is there anybody here that feels like giving up sometimes I can't be a mother anymore I can't be a wife anymore I'm not good enough to run this business I'm not good enough to raise these children I went off on them last time I feel like a failure can't control my anger whatever it is I'm here to tell you I feel you today so we got our own self we're dealing with but then on top of dealing with our own issues and our own flaws then I got the exhaustion that comes from Satan's attack Satan will attack you he's your other enemy Satan attacks us because he studies us he knows how to attack us Satan knows what we like and what we're how we're wired and and the things we're interested in he knows what we feel entitled to you know a lot of temptation to the Christian comes from entitlement he knows what we feel entitled to because of all we've sacrificed and all we've been through and all the hell we've been through and all the difficulty we've had and how much we've held out and how long we've gone without and how long it's been since we did that and how long we've been doing the right thing. And since we've been doing the right thing so long, it's time for us to do what we want to do. You understand what I'm saying? And so Satan knows how to come at us just like he came at Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights right while he was hungry and tired. Matthew chapter 4 verse 3 Satan says, come on, Jesus, I got something for you. You've been working hard, man. I'm paraphrasing. You've been doing a lot for God. Look at how much you've given up for God, how much you've sacrificed for the Most High, how much you put it down for God. Come on, Slim. And I mean Slim. There's 40 days you ain't ate in a long time. You lost, lost a lot of weight. It's time for you to do you, Jesus. It's time for you to take care of yourself. It's time for you to eat. So check this out. Why don't you do this? Since you're the son of God, see these stones right here. Let's make these stones into bread so you can get your eat on. 
Now, here's what I've never seen before. What Satan was trying to get Jesus to do, this temptation was not him eating. Because it's okay to eat when you come off a fast. The temptation was not him eating bread. Because it's okay to eat bread when you come off a fast. The temptation was for him to make something that wasn't bread into bread. And to eat something that he had no business eating. That's the temptation of Satan. Let me slow it down so you can get this. The way Satan tempts us is he didn't have to make you feel like you're hungry. You already know you're hungry. I ain't ate in 40 days. What Satan wants to do is is put an inappropriate meal in front of you and make you feel like it's appropriate. So take these stones which should be supporting you and consume that which should be supporting you. So in other words, to pervert that which God has made for one purpose and use it for your own purpose. Y'all ain't ready for this. So what Satan does is, it's not that you're eating bread, it's not that you're taking care of yourself. He will make an illegitimate meal seem legitimate to you because he knows if you're hungry enough, you'll eat anything. Why y'all get quiet on me right in there? Is this too deep for you? So now I'm tired because I'm wrestling with me. And I'm tired because Satan is tempting me and testing me. But not only that, we got a third enemy called the world. The world is doing its thing. And the world is doing its thing and having a blast doing it. The world is sinning. You don't have to, you don't have to invite the world into your world, into your life. The world will pull up on you at the red light and, and you get to hear what they're listening to. And their windows down. I don't even want to hear that. Turn that down. I ain't listen. You make me feel like I'm in your car. I don't want to be in your car listening to that. And the, the world is doing anything. And I don't know. I don't know. You know, sometimes it seems like the people in the world are having more fun than the people in the church. I don't know if you feel like that. I just want to be real for a second. I, this ain't for everybody. But you know, have you ever wondered as a Christian? And you say, now I, now I became a Christian, you understand? Because that was the right thing to do. And now I done stopped drinking. Well, not this section over here. I done stopped drinking. I just felt that over there. I done stopped smoking. I done stopped getting high. I done stopped partying. I done stopped clubbing. I stopped fornicating. I done moved out with my girl. I done moved out with my boyfriend. We was living together in the church. You know, where I ain't right. I'm trying to get this thing right. We going to premarital. Understand what I'm saying? Trying to get this thing right. Trying to get God up in the relationship. Understand what I'm saying? Trying to do this thing right. Now, I done, I'm paying tithes. I'm giving. I'm saving. I'm in a small group. I'm going to church, and I'm doing all this stuff. And you know what? Meanwhile, the people I used to roll with, my old buddies and my old girlfriends, are still doing the same thing that I I used to do. They still go in the stadium. They still go into the park. Y'all know I know all that stuff. You still go in all these spots. And if I, if the truth be told, they ain't, they don't seem to have any consequences. It doesn't seem like they're going down the tubes. Seems like they're having a good time. So I'm at home looking at Christian videos. You understand what I'm saying? I don't even go roller skate. I only go to gospel skate. Skating to Fred Hammond and the wineers and all that stuff. And I feel like I'm a super Christian now and my friends are having a good time. I don't care who you are. That don't mess with your mind when you're trying to do right by God. But my world is a little different. My world is different because what I have to deal with in my world, in addition to dealing with Satan, in addition to dealing with my own flaws and my own sense of unworthiness, I have to deal with the voices of critical people. Because of what I do, it comes with the territory. I have to deal with worldly voices of critical people even in the church. People who are email experts at telling Keith Battle how to preach. And telling me I'm too transparent and I'm too open about my brokenness and I'm too open about things. And you shouldn't say that in church. You shouldn't say in church when somebody's grandmother there that a woman's private part is a cookie. That's how you got here, Slim. You, she may not call it a cookie, but she call it something. That's how your grandfather got with it. You, you, everybody wants to act like they don't have these conversations in church. But then we have it in the locker room, and we have it in the office, and it's all dirtied up. Let's bring it on in the church. Let's talk about it. Let's see what God got to say about it. I ain't got no problem talking about it. What? But I have these experts who feel it's their assignment to tell me how to preach, what not to say, what you shouldn't be saying, how you should have played this in the message. I know you only got 30 minutes. You should have brought the Hebrew in there. You should have brought the, uh, the, 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 the uh, theocracy of God into the text. And you, you should have talked about warfare. You should have talked about this. And you, and you need Bible study at your church. And you should have your own building. And, and you should have singles ministry. And you should have married couples ministry. And these people who are jacked up themselves and messed up themselves have the audacity to look past the telephone pole in the their own eyes and find a speck in my eye. Why don't you become an expert in your stuff? Let me do what I do. You do what you do and we all be straight. 
But when all that stuff starts happening, it makes you tired. And you know what? Sometimes when you're fighting people, you're fighting people you shouldn't have to fight. I would think when I came to church, I wouldn't have to fight. That's like a fighter. If you ever watch a fight and the fighter's in the ring for three minutes, he on his own. You got to fight, man. You got to fight. It's you and this guy, y'all fighting. And for three minutes, he's fighting until that bell rings. In fact, they'll see something like this. Boom, 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 boom. That means you got 10 seconds left. Well, at least he know I'm getting close to getting a break. <laughs> Bing, the, the bell rings. He gets to go to this corner. You go to the corner, first thing you get is a rest. Man, he killing me out there. I'm tired, man. I don't want to go back out there. Somebody's rubbing his shoulders, saying, you all right. I believe in you. Somebody else is pouring water in his mouth and pouring water on his head, refreshing him. Somebody else is pushing him and encouraging him and letting him know it's going to be all right. You can make it. You're going to make it. Keep your hands up. At all times, protect yourself. You're going to be all right. Somebody else is putting Vaseline on his face and ministering to his wounds and ministering to his cup. For 60 seconds, he's getting encouraged so they have what he needs to go back out there and fight some more. But here's the deal. What if when he went to his corner when the bell rang, there was no chair there? In fact, they didn't even put the chair there. His corner member just looking at him like this. You some garbage. And he's got to stand up between rounds. No rest. Got to stand up between rounds. And they just in his ear. And instead of getting encouragement, he's getting criticism. Now watch this. Now he's got to fight in the ring and in the corner. Y'all ain't ready for this. See, some of y'all are tired because you're fighting the devil in the ring and you're fighting your flesh in the ring and you're fighting the world in the ring. Then you get home when it should be your corner. Now you got to fight your spouse. Now you're fighting your children. Now everybody's against you. You come to church and you should be in your corner, but some greeter is jealous of you and mad at you. You come to your small group and there's a fight in your small group. Well, no wonder you're tired. Everywhere you go, it's a fight. You ain't got nowhere to rest. So my question is, maybe you feel like I felt this Friday when I was just saying, you know what, I'm tired of this. I'm ready to be done with it. I can just, goodbye, I'll open up for Kevin Hart, do some comedy, and be done with it. What? What do you do when you're tired? What do you do when you're battle-worn? What do you do when you feel bad about your own failures and people are criticizing you and the devil is tempting you and you don't feel worthy? What do you do as a mother and a wife when you feel overwhelmed? I can't handle this anymore. What do you do when you've given your best, as Donnie McClurkin says, and your best is never enough? Here's what I want to tell you what God told me Friday in the park. You cannot quit. You must keep on fighting and you must stand. I'm going to say that again because I'm preaching to somebody right here. You cannot quit. You got to keep on fighting and you must stand. Help me preach this right now. I want you to just shove somebody right next to you on the arm and just say you got to keep fighting. Push somebody and say you got to keep fighting. You got to keep fighting. You can't be a punk right now. You got to keep fighting. The devil ain't playing fair. You got to keep fighting. There's a fight on the line. You got to keep fighting. And it doesn't matter what your personality is. You can be a calm person or a co competitive person. You still got to fight. And I'm not just blowing smoke. This is in the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 6, if you have a Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. If you don't, it'll come on the screen. Verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6 says this. It says, be strong in the Lord. Finally, be strong in the Lord. It's interesting. When Paul writes that, when he writes that, He's, he's just finished up in chapter 5, verses 22 to 33, talking about marriage and the roles of the husband and wife and the challenges of marriage. Then he gets to chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, and he talks about the challenge that exists between a father and his children. Talking about the parent-child relationship. Then he gets to verses 5 through 9 in chapter 6, and he talks about this employee-employer relationship and the tension that can exist then. And so after talking about marriage and after talking about parenting and after talking about tension at work, he says, now be strong. Because he knows that's the point where we're giving up. We're giving up because we're tired of this. And we're tired of that. And we're tired of the other. And so he says, now be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power, put on the whole armor, the full armor of God, verse 11 says. Verse 11. And then it says uh, that you, so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 12. 
Um, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the, the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand. Everybody say stand. stand. You may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to what? Stand. Then verse 14 says, stand firm then. Mm. In this passage, whenever you're doing hermeneutics on a passage, you're studying a passage, the key is to find out what God is after, is to find out what are the imperatives in the passage. What is the command in the passage? There are three imperatives, three commands in this passage. The first one is in verse 10, and that is the command to be strong in the Lord. It's interesting, even though it's an imperative, it's an imperative passive word. Which means that even though you're told and I'm told to be strong in the Lord, it cannot be done with internal strength. It must be done and that strength must come from external resources. In other words, strength must come upon you. You can't just be strong and just muster up strength and just reach down inside. Not for this war. You can't just go down inside of you and find something. You must receive it. And the place you get it from is in the second imperative. Watch this. Put on the full armor of God. The way you get strong in the Lord is by putting on God's armor. That's what makes you strong. And then the third imperative in the passage is in verse 14, where it says, having done all the stand, stand firm. Now, the only way you can stand firm, which is an imperative of determination, is if you do what it says in verse 13, right before verse 14, and that is put on the full armor of God. So you got these two bookend imperatives. Be strong imperative of determination. Be a stand imperative of determination. But in order to do both, you got to put on the full armor of God. So you got to be determined to fight, but you also got to be dressed for the fight. Your determination to stand, your determination to fight, your determination to be strong, your ability to be strong comes from putting on the full armor of God. Now watch this. Again, the point is, here's my point for today. I want to give you my point. God commands us to prepare to fight our enemies. It's a command. He commands us to prepare ourselves to fight our enemies. Not just to sit back and let stuff happen. But he says, I need you to fight. A lot of us need to hear that because we don't fight spiritually. We don't fight. When we're under spiritual attack, most of us take a passive role and we just sort of sit back and just just kind of just cower in a corner and just wait on Satan to finish. Just like, Okay, just oh, everybody be still. Hopefully he won't just take everything from us. Maybe if we're nice, he'll go leave us alone and go mess with another family. <laughs> no. You have to fight the devil. This, the devil is a bully. And bullies tend to mess with people that don't fight back. Everybody in their neighborhood had a bully growing up. Maybe it was you. But whoever the bully was, bullies don't fight. Bullies bully. Bullies operate in intimidation. So imagine a little boy, and he's in his room, and he's crying his eyes out, and he's just in there crying, and he's cowering, crying. And so his big brother comes in the room, sees his little brother crying, and says, what's wrong? He says, Jason, Jason keep picking on me, and he put me in my head, and he takes all my stuff. Who? Jason. Oh, Jason, the bully. He used to do the same thing to me. Really? Yep. <laughs> what happened? He, he's, he's, he does it every now and then now, not as much, but even when he does, it doesn't go as far. And so the boy says, well, what did you do to stop him? And I hit him back. You'll get that on the way home. I hit him back. Bullies don't want to fight. They want to intimidate. They're looking for a fight. Listen to what it says in James chapter 4, verse 7 teaches us to hit the devil back. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. I used to think resisting the devil was to cower until he finished. Just, okay, Satan, just go, all right, all right, uncle. No, resist the devil means you stand up to him and you hit him back. You do that, he'll flee from you. Now, he will be back because he believes that eventually you're going to quit and you're going to give in. But every time he comes back, hit him again. Now, you're not fighting physically. It's a spiritual fight. So you don't fight with your hands and your feet. You fight with your weapons. Your weapons are prayer and the word of God, obedience to God. That's how you fight back the devil. But every time he comes, you must fight. 
It's a fight. You understand? It's a fight. So when you fight, you have to fight. Everybody say, help me preach it. Everybody say, fight. fight. You got to fight. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, but you got to fight. The kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. You've got to fight. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him, but you got to fight. You have to fight. And I knew when I preached this, I wasn't going to be the only one in here in a fight for their life. Some people are fighting for their medical lives right now. And you can't be passive about it. You can sit back, but you got to fight. You got to fight. Some people are fighting every day just to be able to get through the day and do basic things medically. And I don't know. Listen, I can't do anything for you. We can't do anything about yesterday. Yesterday's gone. And we can't do anything about tomorrow. It ain't got here yet. But we can fight today and say, God, you are my healer. You are the Lord who heals me. You made this body. So I put it in your hands. I don't know what the doctors are saying. If they can't figure it out, would you use them to figure it out? But whatever you do, God, I put my life in your hands. That's how you fight. Maybe somebody here is in a domestic fight right now. Somebody is in a situation where Satan is trying to take your children from you, trying to take your child's mind, trying to get them strung out on drugs and get them strung out on alcohol. Some of them are sexually confused and don't know who they are sexually. And this ain't no game now. The devil is playing dirty right now. He's messing with your children. And when he starts messing with your children, you got to draw a line in the sand and say, it stops right here, devil, right here at my door. Not my house, not my child, not my family. I'm fine. Fighting. Some of you are in a fight for your psychological wellness. He's trying to take your mind from you, trying to steal your sanity, make you think you're crazy and you're delusional and you're losing your mind and people around you will tell you you're crazy. You can't let that stuff get in you. You've had some pain. All of us are a little crazy, all the stuff we've been through, but don't let people speak that into your life. You, you, you receive the wellness from God because he says, I've given you power, love, and a sound mind. You've got to fight. You've got to fight. This is a fight. This is a fight. This ain't no pretty. This ain't no time to be cute. This ain't no time to be pretty. This is time to fight. And then he says, he also says, and you have to stand. Don't just fight. God said to me, get up, stand up, and stand. Whatever you got to do. In fact, the verse says, having done everything you could to stand. Whatever you've had to do to stand up. If you had to lean on a cane, just as long as you stand it. You got to lean, lean on a walker, make sure you're standing. If you got to grab a rail or hold on to a chair, just don't give up. Don't give in. Just keep standing. Whatever it is you got to do, if you got to back yourself up against a wall to brace yourself, just keep on standing. Why? Because it's too much at stake to fall now. You got to keep standing. You got too much to fight for. So that takes determination, right? But in order to fight well, you got to be dressed to fight. In verses 14 to 18, he talks about this stuff we got to put on to fight. Because listen, listen, when it comes time to fight, it ain't time to be cute. You can be cute later. It's fighting time now. I used to love watching girls fight when I was growing up. It's a whole nother level with girls fight. Because they got to go through so much stuff before they fight. We're like, oh, hell for, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. They kick their shoes off, uh-uh. Who you talking, who you talking to? Vaseline their face up so nobody scratch them. You ain't gonna scratch me, uh-uh. And all that, all that equipment, it's like a, it's like a pre-fight, you know, thing they go through before that. Fight could have been over by now. They go through all this stuff. Uh-uh, ho, ho. No, pull this track out before she try to grab this. Get it, get it. They know. Girls know it's fighting time. It ain't time to be cute. Time to fight. Then they got to do all this after the fight. Oh, yeah. i tell you about me. <laughs> well, that's what God is saying in Ephesians 6. You got to get dressed to fight. He says, put on the belt of truth. Put on the helmet of salvation. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. All of this stuff, by the way, we're going to look at is allegorical. It's not literal. You can't go to work like that now. <laughs> you know, people be like that, man, I'm going to work. I'm going to be armored up. <laughs> You're going to work with a helmet on. like Oh, Dallas Cowboy helmet on. I'm, like, I'm ready for you demons in here today. <laughs> Mouth, <laughs> mouthpiece and everything. No, it's, it's, it's spiritual dressing. You need to do it. It's not literal, but you do need to do it. So this is what I do. It doesn't matter the order that you put it on. It starts off with the, with the um, in verse 14, it starts off with the belt of truth, 
But, you know, you can, it doesn't matter as long as you get all the pieces on. The belt of truth. So, so this is what you do. You wake up in the morning and you get, before you leave the house, you say, God, I want to put on the belt of truth. And I, I pray that this truth would gird me, that I'll be stabilized by the truth. It's one of Satan's traps and tricks is lies. Lord, let me be so acquainted with your truth that I can see a counterfeit when it comes. I want to be able to counter counterfeit with your truth. So gird me with your truth. Then he says, then he says in verse 14, he says also, put on the breastplate of righteousness, which is, which is a part of the armor that protected all of your vital organs. So he says, listen, so, so this is what we say. It particularly protects the heart. So Lord, because my heart is the seat of my emotions, use the blessed breastplate of righteousness to protect me emotionally. I don't want my feelings to cause me to do something destructive. So guard my heart with the breastplate of righteousness. Let my, let my, watch this, let me behave above my feelings. Then, oh, you like that, huh? Yeah, I thought y'all was asleep. The next thing he says is, is then, then he says, in the next verse, he says, and put on, and, and let my feet be prepared and fitted with the gospel of peace. So when you put your shoes on, you say, Lord, let me walk in peace today. Let me walk in peace so that nobody will, will trigger me. Let, so that something that's done or something that's said won't make me go off on somebody. I'm serious. Let me walk in peace because you know certain things will trigger you. And certain things will set you off and throw your whole game off. So Lord, let me walk in peace today so that when the bad thing happens, I can respond in peace and not go to pieces. Then the next thing he says, let me take up the shield of faith, which, which I can which stop all the fiery arrows and the flaming arrows that Satan sends my way. So when Satan sends an idea or he sends a message to me, may it not get all the way to me. Let me use my shield to block it, my shield of faith. And there's something you block it with, and I'll come back to that in a moment. There's something you come back with. Then the next thing he says in verse 17, he says, let me put on the helmet of salvation. You know what that means? Lord, Lord, as I dress with the helmet of salvation this morning, let my thinking be right. Let me have a saved mind today. Let me think like a Christian today. Give me the mind of Christ. Protect my thoughts from drifting off into old evil thoughts or new evil thoughts. Let my mind be grounded in salvation. Then he says, he gets into the first of two offensive weapons. Everything else was protection. Everything else was defensive that we put on. Everything else was to protect us. Now he says, let me take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now I can fight back. Now I move from just being determined just being a spectator to being a participant in this fight. Let me use the sword of a spirit, which is a, is a skillful weapon, the word of God to fight back. So when Satan shoots a dart or an arrow at me, I can not only block it, but I can come back with the truth, the word of God. That's why your knowledge of the word has got to be such that you can respond with something that's accurate to combat what he tempted you with. That's why spiritual ignorance and biblical illiteracy is no longer going to work. You cannot be biblically illiterate and fight this war. You can't be spiritually trifling and, and not study the word and get into the Bible yourself. You got to do that because you, you won't have anything to fight with. You'll be fighting. You can only fight with what you know. So, you know, what we fight with we fight with cliches we picked up in the streets and we fight with stuff we picked up in the barber shop, or in the beauty salon or in, in, in the club. You can't fight with that a spiritual fight. You got to fight with the word of God. And if you're not in it, you ain't going to know what to say. So, so I, the word of God, and then the next spiritual weapon is prayer. Prayer seals the whole thing. Praying about everything in verse 18. All kinds of prayers and requests. That seals it all because it takes prayer to make this all happen. That's the goal. That's how you get dressed. And here's, here's the takeaway. Here's the takeaway. Make that a part of every day. Make dressing for battle a part of your daily routine. So what, this is what I do. I start with the helmet because that's just easy to remember. All right, Lord. Make my thoughts right. Protect my thinking today. I go to the breastplate of righteousness. Lord, guard my heart, my feelings. Let me behave above my feelings. Lord, gird me with truth. May I be so acquainted with the truth that I won't be deceived by a lie. Let me walk in peace. Let me use your word accurately to fight every temptation. And help me to be prayerful all day. That's how you get dressed. And you do that every day. And as the day goes on, if you feel like the enemy is getting the best of you, then you got to regroup and redress. You don't just put this on in the morning, you straight all day, not in a war. Sometimes you got to regroup and regress. You know, redress. You know what, Lord? I'm sorry. I got all track. I'm back to you again. Get my mind right. <laughs> Check my feelings, God. Let me walk in peace and let me have the truth. Let me start again. 
And we do that every day. You know why? Because God doesn't want us to quit. He wants us to fight. Let's pray. Somebody's phone ringing. Let's pray. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, for this truth. May it really transform our lives, not just inform us, but transform us. I pray that this message will work for somebody. Not just something we hear, but we heed it in our lives. Thank you for the opportunity to share it. May we benefit from it this week in Jesus' name. Amen.